This explain everything video aims to go through and summarize the main parameters that you need to discuss when you're describing the radiographic appearance of normal versus abnormal anatomy. So this provides you with a quick summary of the three main components that I expect you to address when you're answering a radiographic appearance question in an exam. So the first thing that you consider when you're describing the radiographic appearance of a certain structure is going to be the density or the intensity of the structure of interest. So what we mean by that is when we're describing the density of a structure, this is when we're using terms such as radiopaque, semi-radiopaque, and radiolucent. So we use this terminology rather than saying it is a black or a white or a gray structure. So remember that density is only appropriate, and those three terms are only appropriate when we're describing CT or X-rays, because we know that the absorption potential of radio waves is going to be dependent on the actual material density of a structure of interest. When we're talking about intensity then, intensity is going to be specific to MRI scans. So you should be familiar with terms such as high signal intensity, intermediate signal intensity, and then any black structures, which are going to have essentially very little to none um, hydrogen protons or water content, is going to be classified as a void structure. So our void structure is going to be our black structures on an MRI scan. So regardless of whether it's T1 or T2 weighted, we'd still use these three major terms. Um, however, they will slightly differ depending on if it is T1 or T2 because we are obviously looking at the sensitivity towards different materials. When I'm asking you to then describe fractures, for instance, when we're talking about a fracture, especially with CT and X-ray, which we know is going to be the standard modality requested for fracture evaluation, all fractures are going to appear as radiolucent. So the reason for this is if you imagine that you take a bone, you snap it in half straight through the diameter of the trabecular bone and you disrupt the cortical bone too, essentially what you're introducing into that bone space or that fracture space is going to be air. Of course, you're going to have surrounding tissues and structures also seep into that space. So when I'm talking about the radiographic appearance of a fracture, it's asking you the appearance of the space in between the bones. So then the second criteria that we're interested in is going to be the shape of a structure. So this can be the shape or the characteristics of a structure if we're talking about abnormal anatomy in the case of fractures or pathology. So I want you to pretend for this specific criteria that you're explaining the shape to a 10 year old. So I want you to use simple terms such as it's a linear or horizontal or diagonal or oblique or semicircle or circle or irregular or complex sort of shape. For characteristics, what we're more interested in is in the case of a fracture, for example, we have obviously learnt about the different types of fractures. So if you go back to my revision lecture on medical imaging, we spoke about um, the different fracture descriptors. We also spoke about the different types of fractures. So if it is an incomplete versus a complete fracture. We also introduced terms such as displaced or non-displaced. And we also spoke about angles, for example. 
So all of these criteria or these descriptors fall under the characteristics of a particular fracture. So if we're talking about tears, tears are going to be relatively similar. We'd be talking about the grades of tears um, for MBBS, um, or we'd be talking about types of tears, um, or what the tear looks like in terms of if it's a complete tear or a partial tear. The third thing that we're interested in then is going to be the location of the structure in the field of the scan. So when we're talking about the location, this is going to be um, more important when we're talking about the relative um, relationship to surrounding structures. So if we're talking about the patella, for instance, we know that the patella is going to lie anterior to the femur. Um, or if we're talking about soft tissue structures, such as um, ligaments or muscle tendons, we know that they're going to attach to bony prominences. So it's important to talk about those attachment points. So for example, if we consider the attachment of the posterior cruciate ligament, for instance, we have learned about the acronym LAMP, which means that we know that the posterior cruciate ligament is going to attach to the posterior intercondylar fossa, of the tibia as well as the medial condyle of the femur. So if I'm asking you to describe the radiographic appearance of a ligament, you would then have to tell me both the attachment sites um, at both the tibia and the femur. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to pull up a couple of CT and MRI scans just to go through practicing how I would describe the radiographic appearance of particular um, normal anatomy structures as well as some fractures. So I've now brought up a T1 weighted MRI of the knee and if I ask you to describe the radiographic appearance of the following two structures, so the posterior cruciate ligament and the patella, I will work through how we describe this and what I would expect as a master answer. So firstly, if we're focusing on the posterior cruciate ligament, if we highlight where the posterior cruciate ligament is located, firstly in our scan, these are going to be the boundaries. Okay, so if we consider then, sorry, if we write for PCL, if we then consider Firstly, what is the density of the structure? So if you think back, you know that the cruciate ligaments, regardless of whether it's posterior or anterior, is going to be a ligament. Okay, We know that ligaments on both a T1-weighted and a T2-weighted MRI are always going to be a void structure. So our first criteria is the intensity of the PCL is going to be void. So just a note on this, if I ever give you a fat suppressed MRI, regardless of what the image is, I always want you to go back to theoretically, according to a textbook and according to the tables that are in your prac notes, what is the actual signal intensity of that specific structure, regardless of whether um, we're looking at T1 or T2. Okay, so then the second criteria how would we describe the shape then of the PCL? You could be very simplistic and say that it's going to be linear um, or it's going to be a diagonal or oblique band. So you can say that it's a fairly thick diagonal band fibers and then the third thing is going to be the location so now what we're interested in is how if you were describing the location of this ligament in the scan to another individual how would you do that 
So assuming the person knows the anatomy, you can say that it's going to attach over here, which is going to be the posterior intercondylar fossa. of the tibia and we can see up here going by our lamp acronym we know that it has to attach to the medial condyle of the femur. So you need all three of these components to get a full mark for that question. If you only have two you'll get half a mark. So then our second example is looking then at the patella. So if we're going to describe the radiographic appearance of the patella, this is the structure of interest. We can see just by tracing it that it's a fairly irregular structure. Okay, so let's just go back to our convention then. So the first, so we know that the patella is made up of bone for one. Okay, so when we consider bone, we know that it's going to be both cortical and trabecular bone. Okay, so in terms of describing the density then, or oh, sorry, the intensity, we know that bone, regardless of whether it's cortical or trabecular, is going to be a void structure. However, the tricky thing is when we're talking about long bones or sesamoid bones as such, when you have trabecular bone in the middle, so let's just shade this a different color. So in the middle here, yes, you have trabecular bone, but something that you also have is yellow bone marrow. So yellow bone marrow, if it is present in trabecular bone, is going to be a high signal intensity. So if trabecular bone is going to be void, think about back in the day when you do finger painting, if you mix a black structure or a black paint with a white paint, you are going to get a gray paint. And you can see that by the coloration. So the coloration in here, so our intermediate gray is going to be consistent with an intermediate signal intensity. So we'd say in fact that the trabecular bone is going to be an intermediate signal intensity. So the way you would describe this then, you would say that the patella has a void outline or um, a void periphery or the cortical bone of the patella is going to be void, but the trabecular bone is going to be of an intermediate signal intensity. The second thing to consider then is going to be the shape. Well, it's fairly irregular, I would say. Some people say that it looks like a pebble You can also say it's a irregular um, bone which has one, two, three, four, five sides. Again, keeping it simple. And then the third thing is going to be the location. So in our specific scan, where is it located? Well, firstly, we can see over here, it is going to be anterior to the femur. We can also see this tendon over here is going to be the tendon of the quadriceps femoris. So you would say that it is posterior to quadriceps tendon. And you would then also have to talk about the superior and the inferior relations. So it is going to be um, relatively inferior to the super patella bursa and it's going to be um, superior to the infrapatella um, space or fat. So if we now look at a couple of examples of CT, 
So the first thing I want to focus on is going to be the image located on um, your right. So what we're looking at here is going to be a fracture through the middle of the spinous process of C7. Okay, so describing the radiographic appearance structure then. Okay, we know that any fracture, regardless of where it is, um, on a CT scan is going to be radiolucent. The second thing in terms of describing the shape of it is we have, um, so remember going back to our fracture evaluations. So this specific type of fracture looks like a fairly oblique fracture. Remember an oblique fracture is going to have an angle less than 90 degrees. So we can say that it's a radiolucent oblique displaced because we can clearly see that the posterior aspect of the spinous process is now separated from the anterior part. And then the third thing is going to be the location. So if we know our anatomy, we'll know that it's going to be um, the cervical vertebrae C7. Okay, so we can say that in total, this specific fracture we can see, it's a radiolucent oblique displaced fracture um, of the spinous process of C7. Okay, if we move to the next one then. So the next fracture is fairly complex. Um, it is typically known as a snowboarder's fracture. So a snowboarder's fracture is going to happen when you have extreme dorsiflexion, which means that you have a crushing injury between the talus and the calcaneus. So in terms of describing the, dense, the radiographic appearance, first thing again, we know that any fracture is going to be radiolucent. Okay, the second bit, and this is where it kind of gets tricky, is going to be the characteristics. So remember with the characteristics, we either talk about complete versus incomplete fractures. Um, we also talk about simple versus compound fractures. So this is still going to be a simple fracture. You don't need to go into that level of detail. Okay. Um, you wouldn't really use the terms complete versus incomplete because we're essentially looking at fragments. So in terms of using our fracture evaluation in terms of fracture line descriptors, this fracture is going to be consisted with a commuted fracture. So we know that a commuted fracture occurs when you have more than two fragments. So a commuted fracture is just referring to these individual fragments over here um, on the distal aspect of the talus. The third bit is then going to be the location. Okay, so as I mentioned, the location of the specific crushing fracture is going to be, um, you can either say in the subtalar joint, or I'd actually prefer you to say um, superior to the subtalar joint, or alternatively, you can say distal to the talus. So the specific um, snowboarder's fracture we can see is going to be a radiolucent commuted fracture located at the subtalar joint. So I hope that this clarifies um, how we interpret fractures as well as the normal anatomy on both CT and MR. It is very important that you revise the convention and always remember whenever you see the term or hear the term radiographic appearance that you automatically remember that we're describing the density, intensity, secondly the shape and thirdly the location. Thank you very much for your attention.